don't even ask. Okay, I'll tell you. Apparently nowadays, it's impossible to find someone to talk about normal, casual, everyday things like zombies, vampires, UFOs, you know what I mean? I met this guy, and I was really hoping that we'd have something to talk about, something in common. But it took one word to prove me wrong. So I have to go back to the one man who never disappoints me and dedicate an entire show to the greatest guy ever. Tonight, we pay tribute to one of my favorite actors of all time, Christopher Lee. There is a girl. Bring her to me. When William Shakespeare wrote, the Prince of Darkness is a gentleman, he could have been describing this man, Christopher Frank Carandini Lee, known to the world, of course, simply as Christopher Lee. In his 90th year, as this program goes to air, this incredibly gifted actor is used to breaking records and making cinema history. Born in 1922, he was with the British Secret Services in World War II and was related to Ian Fleming, who wrote the original James Bond books. He stood some six feet five in height, so it was almost inevitable that when Lee chose an acting career, the parts of heavies and villains would choose him. Still today, playing bad guys in the Star Wars and Lord of the Rings sagas, it was in 1958 that he played the role that would immortalize him in cinema history and in this girl's icy heart. This is the story of Dracula, a creature who destroys all whom he touches. Dracula the terrifying, the feared, who sleeps in the tombs of the dead by day and arises at night to inflict his terror upon the innocent and the unsuspecting. Oh, you must help me. You must. You're my only hope. You must. I'll help you. I promise. Oh, now wait! Christopher Lee was in that as well! He played Frankenstein's monster! Please try and understand. This is not Lucy, the sister you loved. It's only a shell, possessed and corrupted by the evil of Dracula. How do you destroy a fiend who has so far proven himself indestructible? Those who come to end his reign of terror stay to become his victims. Castle Dracula is summoned here in Klausenberg. Will you tell me how I get there? You ordered a meal, sir. As an innkeeper, it's my duty to serve you. When you've eaten, I ask you to go and leave us in peace. This is the doctor who dares to challenge the vampire Dracula. This is the anguished man who fears for the lives of his beloved, the girl who is his sister, and the one that is his wife. Oh, she's the one that is his wife. That strange turn of phrase, that. Ooh, and kind of a warm, itchy feeling in the in the loins as well. Yeah, striking fear at the heart. Well, there you go. Yes, they don't make them like they used to. This is what horror movie trailers were like back in the day when this film was made. But trailer schmaler, Christopher Lee's performance is absolutely timeless. There's so much to love about Christopher Lee as Dracula. For one thing, he wasn't afraid to get physical and throw people around, and I like that in a blood-sucking monster. But Lee had brains to go with the brawn, as he proved time and time again the tall, dark, and gruesome star could really act. Here are a couple of clips from The City of the Dead, another of his relatively early roles. Hmm, looking pretty grim. Well, this is familiar territory for a number of period horror films, your standard witch being burned at the stake. And, of course, the bit where she curses her tormentors, if I'm not mistaken. Well, she gets by with a little help from below. I have made my pact with the Orusible. Hear me! Started for people of Whitewood when they burned Elizabeth Selwyn in 1692. 
Though, as I've said, little is known today of the actual practice of witchcraft in 17th century New England, superstition, fear, and jealousy drove the Puritans to accuse their friends and relatives of consorting with the devil. Raiding around huge bonfires, repeating vindictive chants, they consigned the poor creatures to the flames. The tortured souls cried out in agony as the flames mounted higher and higher. Burn, witch, burn, witch, burn, burn, burn. Think that crazy beat. That will be all for today. Tomorrow will be my concluding lecture on the history of witchcraft in 17th century New England. I shall bring along some illustrations which I'm sure will interest you all. I'll bring the matches. <laughs> Maitland! Since you chose to attend these lectures, I had hoped that it was in a spirit of scientific curiosity about the subject. What? Consorting with the devil? Christopher Lee's lectures and even his American accent might have drawn scorn from some of his students, but a certain Nan Barlow finds them so inspiring, she goes off to do research in the very same New England town in which the witch was burned. Right. You can see where this is going. Unpack the dry ice. We're going to need as much of it as we can get. Directions. Uh, take road 28A, turn onto the Wamport Road, bear left at the fork through to Whitewood. Whitewood? Am I that far away? No, ma'am, not far. Not many God-fearing folks visit Whitewood nowadays. If I were you, I'd... Now there, you see exactly what I mean. Well, follow this road about two miles. You come to a fork. There'll be a sign, Wamport Road. Turn left, keep straight, there'll be white. Thank you very much. Now, old Coot, maybe. But after being warned off of the place, she naturally goes right on ahead. Women in Directions. Of course, once she gets to the tranquil little New England town of Whitewood, she finds that it's very much like most others of its kind. Now maybe the service is somewhat indifferent at the Raven's Inn, the place she's staying, and the picking's a little lean at the breakfast buffet. But other than that, nothing out of the ordinary. Just your average coastal resort town. Aside, of course, from the Gregorian chants and the fog and the pagan sacrifices, that is. Ah, yes. A little bit of collective counting. Summoning of the demon spirits. And, of course, a little bit of resistance. I am Elizabeth Selwyn. Oh, no. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> what trickery. Wow. There you go. That's a suspense builder for you. And of course, the irony. City of the Dead. What a wonderfully atmospheric film. You almost choke on the carbon dioxide. But we'll be sure to sample more of this film in another installment. So back we go now to my leading man among leading men, Christopher Lee. You know he was Dracula. You've seen him as Count Dooku in Star Wars and Saruman in The Lord of the Rings. But how many people today also realize he was that inscrutable Oriental, that villain for the ages, evil mastermind Fu Manchu? He's back, the world's most evil man, with a fiendish plan of conquest. The world has two weeks to decide Obedience to my orders, or obliteration. There he goes. 4.6 for that dive. And Christopher Lee, once again, in his menacing role of Dr. Fu Manchu. This was actually the fifth and final time Christopher Lee played the part. No matter. <laughs> I like it when the number three condenser overheats. Once again, the dreaded name of Fu Manchu terrorizes all who dare defy him. 
Or, actually, romances. Take her back home and see what we can do. A formula. With this, I can control all things and all men. All things and all men? Huh? Well, it looked like a woman to me. Well, these are pretty neat tricks, and uh, there's something for everyone in Castle of Fu Manchu, including a bunch of actors that you've never heard of before, like this one and and that one. Father. Father? Fu Manchu's got a daughter, and she's kind of smoking. Excellent. What's up with Fu Manchu and just staring out into the nothingness? Never before seen. Never before seen. I don't believe you. But what it does have are explosions. Explosions and more explosions, of course. The castle of Fu Manchu. Ah, oh, Fu Manchu. We miss you in this day and age. I mean, aside from some vaguely offensive racial stereotyping, you wonder why he ever went out of fashion. Moving swiftly along. Lee essays two roles in the end of the world, a white-robed, virtuous priest and a black-robed villain who is actually an alien in disguise. He said of this picture, and I quote, Some of the films I've been in I regret. I got conned into making these pictures in almost every case by people who lied to me. Some years ago, I got a call from my producers saying that they were sending me a script and that some very distinguished American actors were also going to be in the film. So I thought, well, that's all right by me. But it turned out it was a complete lie. Appropriately, the film was called End of the World. Hmm, maybe the title was a giveaway? Anyway, there's nothing in Lee's performance to suggest he was unhappy about where he was. Just witness this breathtaking dimensional transportation scene. The man was clearly at the top of his game, whatever the critics had to say about this picture. In any case, with his CV, Lee could afford to laugh all the way to the bank. A bank in another dimension. We have exhausted all the possibilities. I'll accept two. I know, but we need them now. Yes. It was unusual for Christopher Lee to complain, no matter how bad the film he was in. And if he was in a movie, his very presence seemed to ensure that at the very least it would be so bad that it was good. In any case, my fiendish fans, we have to break now. But we'll be back with more Christopher Lee and two flaps of a vampire bat's wings. Hello again. Such an exciting evening as we review the career of the real Dark Knight himself, a six foot five English gentleman who has been a prince of darkness throughout his entire six decades of cinema. It could of course only be Christopher Lee. Now, although Lee was so often cast in Dracula films and other horror films, he didn't like the label. He once said Don Chaney and Boris Karloff didn't like the word horror. They, like I, went for the French description the theater of the fantastique. So let's take another look at some fantastic theater. A strange hybrid of sci-fi, horror, and disaster from 1977. It's called End of the World. One of the great things about Christopher Lee was that no matter how bad the material, he always gave his all. It's ironic that in 2000 and knots, he ended up playing the Star Wars prequel because in 1977, the year the first Star Wars came out, Lee's career was kind of in the doldrums. Indeed, End of the World may be just the worst film he was ever in. Nevertheless, it is a cool opening sequence, don't you think? Well, just hang in there, you'll see. Ah, here he is. Water's boiling, I'll have fresh coffee in a minute. Looking for an opportunity to kill. That's right, Christopher Lee's famous predatory face. He was able to make a lot of movies with that glaring stare. Please, need to call the police before it's too late. Before it's too late for what, Father? Uh, uh, use your telephone. Help yourself. It seems he's forgotten what's wrong. 
Okay. I'm sure one quick call will change all that. Doesn't seem to have a dime. Yeah. There you go. Take care of all your troubles. Need help. Help. All of us. Christopher Lee, I think, needed a lot of help. In fact, he could have used a lot of help from better agents, getting him better films. I told you things would liven up. Mm, some coffee. That was not that particular bit part player's only contribution to cinema. In fact, Simi Bao had bit parts in everything from Beetlejuice to Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Didn't make it past minute three in this one, but never mind, it's not the end of the world. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, that's right, it is the end of the world. In the name of the father, the, oh, forget it. Well, he learned that walk from one of his Dracula films. It's what good actors do. They bring a lot of experience to the table. And now, Christopher Lee meets... Christopher Lee! Welcome back to St. Catherine's, Father. Lee was also marvelous at playing a proper English gentleman. Snobbish, arrogant, and pompous, that is. Such as the character he played in one of my favorite horror films of all time, Horror Express. Look at how he handles the idea of giving a bribe to a station porter. Thank you. It's called squeeze in China. The Americans don't know how. And in Britain, we call it bribery and corruption. And in England, they call it bribery and corruption. Love it. You. Get out! Huh? Sir Alexander Saxton. Yes? Captain O'Hagan, sir. General Wang told me to find you and to make myself useful. Um, uh, now I remember. I do have Your Excellency's ticket. Your, your ticket, right here. Thank you. Now, who's this chap again, you might ask? You might ask that if you're not familiar with the golden age of British horror, when alongside Christopher Lee, this man reigned supreme. Peter Cushing, of course. Dr. Wells. Miss, are you all right? What's really touching is that Cushing and Lee were the best of friends, although they often played enemies on screen. Frenemies, you might even call them. In Horror Express, Christopher Lee plays Professor Alexander Saxton. He discovers an ancient frozen fossil and takes it with him aboard a trans-Siberian train, where he meets Dr. Wells, played by Peter Cushing. Now, during the trip, the life force trapped in the frozen creature is released and then goes about killing the passengers. Miss, are you there? Spooky. It must be somehow hypnotizing this poor guy.
Somehow Cushing remained pretty calm during the whole thing. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. This is all very well and good, but where's Christopher Lee? Ah, yes. <laughs> Here he is. wrong? That woman who was killed. The engineer, you know, the uh, chess player. He told me that she was an international spy. <laughs> Christopher Lee doing his very best Sean Connery. Oh, you do? Well, could that fact have had anything to do with her death? What do you think? Dr. Wells and I performed an autopsy on her. Her brain was completely smooth, just like the baggage man's. Everything had been erased. Now, I have a theory about this. I'm only a policeman, Professor. I don't have much education. Sad but true. Well, I'd make it simple. Mm, arrogant. Supposing that creature, the one you killed, was capable of taking ideas directly from other people's brains and transferring them to its own. Mm, suppose. You mean it sucked other people's brains? Absorbed through the eyes. That was our first clue. The eyes going white. Then, if the beast had absorbed your brains, all of your education would have gone into its brain. Mm, that must have happened to some of the politicians around these parts of the Much world. Much so, because what it had taken from me would have been added to the learning that it already had. Ah, yes, and then the zombie would be a genius! Baggage man and thief. What was the creature looking for? That we'll never know now that it's dead. Smarts. Yet, what? A creature like that. How would it ever die? What a marvelous man. 60 years of filling the screen in our lives with his magnetic presence. Naturally, he gets an Igor Lifetime Achievement Award. I mean, we can't not give Christopher Lee an Igor Lifetime Achievement Award. <laughs> 